verses 30 through 32 through 37. Again, that's Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. And it reads, All the believers were in one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales, and put at the apostles' feet, and was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a, Le a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field, who, sold a field he owned, and bought the money at, and put at the apostles' feet. Thank you, Josiah. Well, it's good to be back with you. If you've ever been traveling and had the guy coughing in the middle of the plane, I was that guy. <laughs> uh, not especially a good thing, but uh, I did make it back. Nancy has stayed to be able to help my son with another project, so she's going to be gone for a couple of weeks, so she will be back. Uh, at some point, um, but it's been a great time, a great Christmas, and uh, you give the grandkids lots of presents, and they give you disease, so <laughs> that seems to be the way it all works. So I especially like singing this morning, Jason. Uh, I can finally sing the bass part. <laughs> That's always good. So thanks to Joel for preaching last week and to uh, Calvin for teaching, teaching the Life Tree Cafe. Um, one thing that you might want to look at in your bulletin is the, on the back of the calendar is the people who are serving in worship. And so you might want to check that to make sure that your name is on it and when you're going to be there. Uh, so if you have a problem with that, well, please let someone know. End of the year. What do we do with the end of the year? You know, you're ready to start another one, but that's not till tomorrow, which isn't that far away, right? But uh, I want to go back to a time when things were really exciting in the church and just be able to look at that. Peter and John had been put in prison. This is in Acts chapter 4. And you find that Peter and John had been put in prison, and uh, it was a very difficult time for the new church. They didn't know how to do things. They didn't, they didn't have it all together yet. And so everyone had been converted. And there weren't any people who had grown up in the church. Nobody was normal. Nobody knew how to do this and had been in it for years. It just wasn't there. And so when you start looking at that, they had met together in Solomon's portico. They were in homes. And now there's a shortage. And now they're trying to tell other people and trying to make it work. And when two of the leaders just get put in jail, it just seems to take all the wind out. And it's like you just can't do it anymore. And so they came together, and they prayed to God. And what they prayed for was not for God to make things easier. But they prayed for boldness. God, please make us bold in speaking for you. And so that was what they decided to pray about. As God filled them with the Holy Spirit, the place where they were was shaken. And it pulled them together as a people. And this is the result of what you see of that. The number who believed were one heart and soul. How do you get that? That's kind of hard to do sometimes, is to get people to even join in for one thing. Uh, and then trying to get them to even like each other, and then trying to get them to be really close to each other. But this, wow, that's a lot different, isn't it? One heart and soul, that's amazing. Uh, and so they had pulled people together, and they preached doctrine. They understood the consequences. They understood they would be put in prison and put to death. But there was a bond that formed because they were taking the risk. And you look at what it says. It says they were one heart and soul together, the power of the apostles as they gave testimony to the resurrection and great grace 
is upon them all. What an amazing time. Have you ever had great grace? I mean, maybe you just get normal grace. So you get, how do you get great grace? Or how do you feel like you've got so much grace? What does it feel like to have great grace on your church? That must be an amazing thing. It's just that everything seems to work and God seems to be moving among you and that there, there are people who are just so much being taken care of. And, and it's just an amazing thing to watch as, as you watch how God is be able to make everything come together. And that must be an exciting, powerful thing when you have a church like that. It was not in the Jewish sacrifices because they had a priest that went in for them. And so they didn't really come to gather. They gathered in synagogues partly, but, you know, that wasn't the same thing. And so this is a whole new experience for them. They have come together for one purpose, to be able to glorify God, to be able to trust in him. We don't live in a world like that anymore. In fact, we are more individualized now than I think at any other time. Uh, we are separated into different places. Uh, we have different parts. Everybody has a different place. I can remember growing up that uh, you had a telephone in the house, if you had one telephone in the house, and it was on a party line. And when it rang three times, it was yours. If it rang four times, it was the neighbor's. And only once or twice, it was those other people down the road. And so you could answer it at anybody's house. And when you picked it up, it might be that somebody else would be on the line. So you had to be careful what you said. Because anybody at any time could pick it up. Now, we would never go for that today, would we? I mean, now we have a personal cell phone. It goes straight to me. It's in my pocket. Please don't call me this morning. I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> But we don't think about not having our own personal cell phone. Why would we? I mean, how are people going to reach us? We might be in another room. We don't want to have to run for the phone. Um, people need to be able to get hold of us. And, and there is so much technology now that we have done this. And so it's not only that, it's the personal computer which means this one is mine. Nobody else gets on it. And I'm the only one who uses it. We have personal space. And so, you know, my personal space is out here and you're not supposed to get in anybody's personal space, right? We even have personal sized pizzas. I mean, <laughs> we have done this to ourselves. We have segmented each other so much that we realize that we don't come together for very much at all. We come together to get our share, our part, and that's about it. But we really don't come together in this kind of sense where we feel like there's one heart and one soul. The Bible has both of these ideas. There are heroes of faith. There are individuals like David who kills Goliath. He's a great warrior. He's a great... Uh, prophet he's the one who writes many of the psalms and so you see David as he's alone with God and how he's able to do all of these things and so it's amazing to watch David and how he is able to do all of this pretty much on his own it isn't that he's joined with a whole lot of other people but as we start looking at this and realizing about this there's other people who are in this who are like families it's Abraham, but it's not just Abraham. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the 12 sons of Jacob, and then it gets you know, further down than that. Or even Joshua with the call to all of Israel, he says, you choose who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, so he's choosing for his family. We will serve the Lord. And so he's choosing for his family. But then there's another sense in which it's bigger than that. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to do. He was trying to bring this community together. We try and crowd into one place, and it's, it's not really community, is it? You get all those people into Disney until it's completely full. And they're not there for each other. They're, you know, jostling and trying to get in line. Uh, that's what happens. Or you put them all in a stadium, and then you're griping about, and everybody's not leaving fast enough. 
This was mine yesterday. I mean, everybody's stuck in one little tin can. Here you are. You've got this much personal space. And then you've got to put a bag down at your feet so that your feet have nowhere to go. And you're supposed to sit in that one little space and don't get in anybody else's because we don't know anybody else on this little plane. We're going to be able to be there and we're going to sit here for five hours next to each other and not say a word, right? After all, why would you talk to them? Do you want to know who they are? Yeah, they don't seem that friendly. I did talk to them, by the way. But it's not community. It's not one heart and soul. We're all smashed together in a very tight place. But there is nothing about community in that. It's not community at all. I mean, we're all together. And I wonder what happens here sometimes. You got enough space to spread out. I mean, you can go anywhere you want. You can almost have your own pew. Everybody always sits on the ends, though. <laughs> and it's just one of those things that we do. How do we get community in church? It was the way that the church started. It was what they were trying to do. Well, I think one of the things is found in 1 Corinthians 11 as he begins talking about the Lord's Supper. He says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe in part that there must be factions among you in order for those who are genuine among you to be recognized. But when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. And he's going to go on down and give them a lot of instruction about this and about what's going on. But I want you to notice this phrase, when you come together as a church. That's where we are today, right? We have all come together as a church. That means much more than when you come together to fly to a certain destination. I mean, we're all sitting in our seat, we're all ready, we're all going to just go, and, and hopefully the pilot's good, and he'll just take us right there, we'll land, we'll be on time, everything's good, we'll all get off, and we'll never talk to each other. And some people might do that with church as well. I came in, I sat down, I didn't need to talk to anybody else. How sad. Because that's really not what it's about, is it? Church is about building this community together. And so while we don't confine you to that small of a space as what you would have on an airplane, it is about when you come together as a church. And here he speaks about one specific thing. When you come together to take communion. He says that should be something that is one of those things that bonds us all together because we realize it's about Jesus Christ and we realize it's about what his sacrifices meant to us and what his death on the cross meant. When you commune together, it's, it's in the name, isn't it? When you come together to commune together. And sometimes we think that, you know, we had the trays passed, it's that little sip of juice and that little bit of cracker, and we say, okay, well, we got that, now it's done. I think it's got to be more than that. How do we get to one heart and soul? How do we get to this place where great grace is upon all of us? Uh, somewhere it's got to come because of that. And I think it must be in the way in which we look at it all. Do we really want to commune with people around us and with God and realize that these are all people part of us? Now, I'm going to warn you to stay away from me today. But... Uh, on any other day, I'll give you a hug or a handshake or something like that. But uh, some things we don't need to share. Christ is one thing we do need to share. And I think that's one of those things that's very important. But it's not just for communion. It's for the whole service. When we come together to sing, it's much better if everybody sings. At least for me. Because you don't want it for me just to sing. Uh, that doesn't sound so good. I like it much better when that's done in community. Or for prayer, maybe that's better if we're the one praying. Or maybe it's just in worship as we come together 
because everybody's involved in that. Everybody is part of that as we all think about it and as we all encourage and lift up each other. And that's one of the things that, mo that is most important. I've seen people who come only for communion. I've never quite understood that. But I think it's because it's the one thing that has been commanded that you do on the first day of the week when you come together as a church. And, and he talks about this when you come together. And so he talks about coming together and they come in, they sit down and they're there. They miss first three songs, of course. And they wait and they get to where, okay, we're just right before communion. And, you know, they go through the communion and then, well, obviously, you got to get out before the sermon starts. You don't want to get it stuck in that. And so they'll get up, and then they'll leave. And you're like, wait a minute. What communion did you really have? How is that communion? When you just came in and sat, and, and it's not communion when you just take of the juice and the bread. Is there anybody that you connected with? Did you connect with God? Did you connect with anybody else? There's got to be communion in that sense of one heart and soul and that great grace being upon us all. And, and, and it's that kind of church, I think, that makes all the difference in the world today. It's that kind of sharing with each other of all the things that we're doing, of what's going on in our life. And that makes a huge difference when it becomes personal. And what I'm trying to say is that's what the early church was. That's what we're supposed to be. That's what Jesus was trying to build. Communion should be one of those things that comes together because it is about Jesus Christ. And it is about what he's been doing. It's not just about each other. It's not we come together because all my friends are there. Well, what happens if your friends aren't there? Well, yeah, I've got to find another church. Why? Because, you know, my friends are over at the other church. Well, I think you're coming for the wrong reason then. Because there's got to be this sense of community together. In John 12, in verse 31, Jesus is getting close to the time of his death. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And that's what he's trying to get across. We draw together because of Jesus Christ. He says, when I am lifted up, when I die on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. Not, we'll draw all people to ourselves because there's a lot of fun things going on. Well, there may be some fun things going on, but that's not why we're here. We're here because of that community. We're here because of Jesus Christ. We're here because he's the one that draws us. And we've been drawn by that cross, and he's the one that holds us all here. We draw together because of the spirit we share, because we're one body in Christ. We draw together because his Holy Spirit bonds us together, and we share that unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's not just drawn to other church members or friends. Jesus expects that. He expects us to be able to be drawn to him. And then what he does is he tells his disciples, I have another command for you. I have one that I want you to be able to follow now. And so in John 13, he changes it. Verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's kind of hard to do by yourself, isn't it? I mean, we can try. We love all those people back there. Look at them. They're good people. As long as they stay back there, we'll love them. You know, we don't really want you up here. But we'll, we'll love you from afar. We'll love you back there. And... That's how we do better at loving people, right? When we don't really know them, when we don't really come around them. No, that's not it at all. We do better at loving when we understand people. When we love like Jesus loved. It's the proof of discipleship. And that's what he's trying to get across. 
He says, my church is a church of people that come together, that love each other, that care about each other, that are drawn by me. And so they come because of me, and they stay to help each other. What a great thing it is to be able to have a group like that, where it's not just people who come and say, well, all right, I've got to give so much, I've got to take so much, and I hope I go to heaven because my name's in the book. There's something wrong with that. It is this community that Jesus is building together. People will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another because that's what disciples do because disciples care about each other. He calls it a new commandment. And Jesus loves us so that we can love each other. And we realize that's what we do as we share. We share in that same family. We're drawn together into worship. We're drawn together into eternal life. We're drawn together into blessings. We're drawn together into this salvation. And we share and encourage and lift up. And that's really what he's talking about. I want to be that kind of a church. It's going to be an exciting year next year. It's been an exciting year this year. And there's even more things going to be coming. It's always that way in Christ, isn't it? Because we share in his cross, we share in the Holy Spirit, we share in his sufferings, we share in the grace that God is able to bring. We share in those blessings of God. What great things we have to uplift and encourage each other. And it's all by our working together that we come to know each other. And so let me encourage you today. Don't be a person who sits way in the back over there or over here or somewhere and says, you know, yeah, those people up there are... No, this is all of us. This is where we get to be together, where we get to know each other. And it is by our working together and by doing things together. The family fusion sounds like a fun thing. At least the commercials are good, right? I mean, they're a little bit crazy, but uh, that should be a fun thing. Do you think that would help us get together? Is if we participate in things like that, rather than just saying, well, I don't know. Maybe it's an important time for us to be able to come together, even if you don't know how it works, just be able to say, this is an important thing that we do. Let's all share together in Jesus Christ. If you're not part of Christ, then this is the time to be. He draws you. He pulls you. He wants you to be his. He says, I want you to come to me because you realize I've laid down my life for you. And what I have to give is this community. It's such a blessing that so many people are able to know and able to be part of. So... As we share in this song, if you need to come, let us pray for you. Come on, we stand and sing.
thank you, Terry, for your lesson today and uh, being able to get through that. We, we, uh, Happy New Year from the elders to all of you. It's been a great year, as has been pointed out, and, and moving to the thing next year won't even be a better year. At least we will do everything we can to make it so. And while the attendance is a little low today, the prayer requests are not. So we have a number of prayer requests here this morning to, to go through. Uh, first of all, I want to announce the elders did meet with uh, Renee Long this morning. She's facing Memphis just to get there. And I don't see her, Renee. I think maybe she had to leave. Okay, so we will announce her again. She's having some, some life issues. So we will pray for her as well. Uh, first of all, the Iberson are asking for prayers for Sandy. Uh, many of you remember Sandy Iberson, and she had had uh, um, a brain tumor, and a brain tumor has began growing back, and she's had, had the surgery three years ago for that, and when they were members here. So we want to remember Sandy Iberson in our prayers. Also, we received a note from Yvonne Clayton, she's asking a special prayers for Bob. Uh, she received a call 